Hello, and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. My name is Rob. Hi, I'm Trisha. And uh, we'd like to welcome you to our current event stream. Happy Monday. Indeed. Um, of course, catch us tomorrow for our third and final installment of the Communist Manifesto series. Uh, Wednesday, we will finally have our piece um, on Emma Goldman. And Thursday uh, will be part 12. Part 12 <laughs> of our Black Panther Party series. <laughs> Yeah. We're almost to the end of it. Indeed. Almost. And then Great. I was uh, I was thinking today that it'd be cool to do, you know, like a, a piece on uh, the MC5 and um, the White like Panther The Rainbow Party. Coalition. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we've already discussed doing a piece on uh, more specifically Fred Hampton and the Rainbow Coalition. Um, so, I mean, we'll just have to see when we can squeeze those in, but they're coming. They are. <laughs> all right. So um, I would assume by now that you all know that you can find us at www.forwearemany.org. Uh, we do have a PayPal link on the website. We also have a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash for we are many. If you like what we what we do and you want to, you know, like help us out, whether it's uh, being a page or a group admin or, um, you know, content creation, articles, art, music, whatever, or if you want to join us on one of the shows, uh, you can email us at forwearemanypodcast at gmail.com and we'll we'll get right back to you or, you or you can message our Facebook page. Indeed. Um, so today we have a few things to cover, I suppose. <laughs> um, ranging from, uh, well, climate change is going to be our first section, but we, we've got some U.S. news. Uh, and then quite a bit of international stuff to catch up on. And these are all situations we've been following. Um, Myanmar, Cuba, um, India, the farmers protests are still happening. It's been months. The military junta is still in power in Myanmar. Um, all right. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good pre-show summary. Um, so let's just dive into climate change. Sounds like a plan. And uh, this first story is from NBC News. Uh, and here's the headline. Earth's energy imbalance removes almost all doubt from human-made climate change. Researchers studying Earth's absorption of the sun's energy found a less than 1% probability that the recent changes occurred naturally scientifically speaking that's a certainty that not an almost certain thing that's yeah yeah um but we, we've be more honest there that's true but i mean it is nbc I, I mean, you got to remember, it's only been the last couple of years that the mainstream media has really been willing to talk about climate change in depth. So they're, they're, they're at least it's, talking about it. Fuck. <laughs> right, right. It's just one of those things that irks me because that 1% is what so many people will cling to of like, but it could be not us. Like. I, I <laughs> it's <agree>. frustrating, <laughs> you know. Um, but anywho, um, for so we all already know that for decades the Earth's energy system has been out of whack, and stability in the climate hinges on a balance between the amount of energy the planet absorbs 
and the amount of energy it emits back into space, such as sunlight reflecting off of polar ice caps. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen the imbalance. We've seen it growing uh, from the polar vortex uh, sneaking further and further south, uh, which might sound contradictory because, you know, everybody thinks global warming, which it is, but climate change is more accurate just because of that. I mean, it's pushing super cold Arctic air down to Texas. Yeah. That's because the jet stream is unstable. Meanwhile, also pushing unnaturally warm waters north towards those ice caps and melting them from underneath. It's not mm -hmm. just what we're seeing melt on the surface. The underside of these icebergs is also melting. And uh, I, I, I guess this is a little off topic, but I mean, I, I've seen people like, you know, put a little bit of water in a glass and fill the, you know, like, have a glass of ice and put a little water in it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then they'll like, you know, take a picture of it in an hour when all the ice is melted. Like, oh, well, see, how can the ice melting possibly rise the sea levels? But like a more accurate way to do that experiment would be to fill the glass up with water and that would represent sea levels and then take ice that is melting and put it in the glass of water. Yeah. Um, because that ice isn't just over other water, it's over land, too. Well, yeah. And has been receding away for so many years. Like, it's drastic. If you look at pictures from the, you know, North Pole or even in some areas of the South Pole from decades ago and look at them now, you can see the receding. It's devastating to the wildlife that lives there. Yes. Um, anyway, so the Princeton unit, uh, these researchers are from Princeton University and they published this paper, uh, last Wednesday in the journal Nature Communications. Um, the researchers behind the paper found that there's less than 1% probability that the changes occurred naturally. And the findings undercut a key argument used by people who do not believe human activity is responsible for climate change. Um, demonstrating that the planet's energy imbalance cannot be explained just by Earth's own natural variations. Um, with more and more changes to the planet, we've created this imbalance where the surplus, where we have surplus energy in the system, said Shiv Priyam Raghuraman. I probably butchered that. I'm sorry. A graduate student in atmospheric and oceanic sciences at Princeton and lead author of the study, that surplus manifests as different, uh, different symptoms. Um, emissions of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse, greenhouse gases from human activities trap heat in the atmosphere, meaning the planet absorbs infrared radiation that would normally be released into space. Melting sea ice, changing cloud cover, and differences in the concentration of tiny atmospheric part particles called aerosols, all of which are affected by climate change, also mean Earth is reflecting less of the sun's radiation back into the cosmos. Um, so essentially what I was just saying. The point is, this study uh, was published to a scientific journal on Wednesday of last week. Um, obviously, it's open to peer review, but the paper is published. NBC News part of, published this article about it, and they have the paper source. So if you want to know more about it, I would recommend that. Um, still in the climate change section here, um, climate change is driving death. Uh, this is from NPR. I guess I should have said that first. Climate change is driving deadly weather disasters from Arizona to Mumbai. Uh, heat waves, floods, wildfires. Uh, we've covered a lot of it, but there's no way that we could possibly cover all of it. So. Right. Um, this is just kind of a brief overview of the last few weeks. Um, do you want to, do you want to talk about this at all or? Uh, sure. 
Uh, Lauren Somner and Rebecca Hersher from NPR's climate team broke down the details in a conversation with Morning Edition's Noel King. Um, the country is experiencing yet another heat wave. They're asking, is this just us or is this summer unusual? Because it's not just our memories. This past June was the hottest June recorded in the U.S. in more than a century, about four degrees hotter than average. I want to um, point out that that is including hotter than the Dust Bowl years. 1936 right. set heat records over the entire continental U.S. And a lot of those are falling this summer. But anyway. Yeah. The heat waves are deadly. Um, so many places are just now re realizing how underprepared they are to deal with them. Um, the connection between these extreme heat events and the climate change is there's been about two degrees Fahrenheit of warming so far worldwide. So far. So, so far, yeah. Sounds small, but it's enough to profoundly shift the statistics of extreme heat events. According to Dr. Radley Horton, um, a climate scientist at Columbia University, he had said that these dangerous thresholds of really high temperature and high humidity could potentially happen twice as often as they have in the past. Um, and I just, I just want to circle back again to 1936. I mean, like, it was triple digits in Chicago with, like, you know, 90 degree lows, and people were literally sleeping in the parks in Chicago. We all know how the police would respond to that now. So I just wanted to point out that key difference as well. Right. Um, about 95% of the West is in drought right now. Uh, there's a clear cycle where heat dries out the land and the vegetation. So when the wildfires do happen, they burn hotter and create their own weather systems in which huge pyrocumulus clouds can generate lightning strike, in turn causing even more fires. I want to just um, point out that word again, pyrocumulus. Um, mm -hmm. Arizona, or Arizona's Weather Authority referred to it as uh, pyrocumulonimbus clouds, but uh, either way. Um, Fire causing clouds. Right. <laughs> Sounds um, bass backwards, but. And, and there's been some crazy flooding in the last few weeks too. Uh, we talked about the flooding in central China twice um we talked about the flooding in germany we flooded we talked about the flooding in northern arizona um and, and now there is there there was a crazy flood in miami arizona i believe it was um that was yesterday saturday maybe i don't know yeah um but yeah i mean i mean it's crazy we've been I don't remember ever seeing as much flooding as I have over the last two years. And it just seems like it's getting worse with time. Right. Like, it's insane to get that extreme of flooding where you're at, especially, I mean, even, what was it, like a week and a half ago um, in Flagstaff? Yeah. Like, there was cars being washed down the fucking road. Well, yeah, and we saw how bad the ones in China were, too. I mean, we didn't see cars going mm -hmm. down the road, but, I mean, it was like a river flowing between the buildings. It was not... It was crazy. There was thousands but, of building collapses. Right. That shit was insane. The water, like, pouring down the stairs, going into the subway system, just flooding everything. Oh, well, um, yeah, and then, and then before anybody thinks that, you know, like, oh, well, Chinese infrastructure just isn't as advanced... Germany's is more advanced than ours, and they had water fucking... They had rivers running down their streets, too. They also had hundreds of uh, building collapses. Hell, look at Detroit. Um, was it 96 or 696 got turned into a river again a few weeks ago? I think it was 94 and 75. 90. Okay. But, but yeah, and I mean, what, like, those freeways flood often already... And uh -huh. all of all of these events were caused by extreme rain events. Mm -hmm. And the uh, infrastructure not being able to handle draining all of that water. There's nowhere for it to fucking go. <laughs> right. Right. Just see um, cars floating, like turning upside down as they bob around in the water. Like, mm, fuck. Um, We've not done a good job with handling any of this. 
Right. <laughs> Plus, well, actually, I, I almost skipped a part. And it's getting more common as the earth gets warmer, because hot air plus hot water equals more moisture in the air. Plus, as the planet heats up, some climate models show winds in the upper atmosphere slowing down in certain places, uh, which is part of the reason for the, the weakening of the jet stream that usually keeps the polar vortex in northern Canada shifting all the way down to Texas in February. Right. Um, so, I mean, we've already seen that. I mean, they're saying climate models show, but we've already literally seen it. Um, and, and scientists are trying to figure out how to predict these um, to save lives. So, I guess at least I'm happy to see that scientists care about saving lives now if only government officials would but uh anyway that's um, that's a whole nother fucking suitcase to unpack yeah i wasn't even gonna bring this up but while we're in climate change uh that flooding in china that we were talked about last week has left over yeah. one million people displaced fuck man um so next i wanted to talk about how the house adjourned and uh yeah, decided know. to give themselves a six fucking week vacation without extending the moratorium on evictions I mean, this is coming from the same lady that showed us a $15,000 refrigerator full of like $1,000 worth of ice cream while people were starving. So, I mean. Right. Fuck you, Pelosi. Um, Anywho. Yeah. So, even though she wasn't involved with the push for uh, the March for Medicare for All, well, none of the squad were. Um, I do got to give a shout out to U.S. Representative from Missouri, Cori Bush, uh, sleeping on the steps of the Capitol on Friday night and pushed to extend the federal eviction moratorium. Um, I know that she was out there Friday night, and I know that she, uh, she was still tweeting Saturday night. So I don't I don't know if she is still out there. I didn't look Sunday, and I haven't looked today. Um, but I mean, if she is, dude, for real, solid fucking darity. Um, right. I actually stand out there. You know, she's been calling for a lot more people to come down and join her to draw some attention to this because that fucking moratorium needs to be extended. There's no excuse for allowing who knows how many people to end up getting evicted because Congress just decided to take themselves a fucking vacation. Yeah. So, I mean, she started tweeting about it Thursday. Uh, she sent multiple, well, she started tweeting about it late Thursday. She sent multiple letters throughout Thursday imploring other House Democrats to return from their adjournment and vote on the Protecting Renters from Evictions Act of 2021. Um, for a little bit of backstory here, if you don't know, there was a CDC order uh, that the Supreme Court talked about, and they said that it was constitutional, but if they wanted to continue it, it had to be an act of Congress. And the date that um, the Supreme Court set was July 31st. So um, they knew about this months in advance. They could have fucking voted on it at any point in time. I, and that ultimately comes down to Pelosi too. I think other Democrats in the House should have been more vocal about bringing it to a vote, but what gets voted on or proposed on the floor of the House all has to go through her. Right. So that being said, um, Nancy Pelosi, <clears throat> go back to Washington, call back the House, and vote yes on the Protecting Renters from Evictions Act of 2021. Um, so in this letter to her colleagues, 
Uh, Corey Bush said, quote, I cannot stand in good or I cannot in good conscience leave Washington tonight while a Democratic controlled government allows millions of people to go on house as the Delta variant is ravaging our communities. Millions of people are about to lose their homes. And as Democrats, we must not give up on the chance to save their lives. Um, Bush, if you don't know, has previously been homeless. Um, she was also a Black Lives Matter organizer. I mean, she's at least got some street credit behind her, unlike some other members of the squad. But anyway, um, she tweeted July 30th, 7.08 p.m. She tweeted, many of my Democratic colleagues chose to go on vacation early today rather than staying to vote to keep people in their I'll be sleeping outside the Capitol tonight. We've still got work to do. I've been unhoused and evicted. I've slept in my car and slept outdoors. I know what it's like, and I wouldn't wish that trauma on anyone, she said. You can tell by the look on her face that she is not playing any fucking games. That's a fair point. Let me, uh... Yeah, can you screen share that? You can tell she's pissed. As she should be, as anybody with ethics should be, at the fact that they all decide to go on fucking vacation. And, wow, I, and I will are. give I will give AOC the little bit of credit on this that she deserves, and I want to emphasize a little bit. She came down there and took some pictures. Right. Okay. I mean, she but tweeted she about stay? it, and she encouraged people to go out there, which is cool. But, like, where did her spine go? Did she stay? No. She went down there and tweeted about it and fucking, you know, put a couple of videos on social media and encouraged people to go out there, and then she went on fucking vacation. Fuck that. She should have been strapping her shit kicker boots on and standing right there with Corey. I agree. I completely agree. She should have shown up with her fucking bug out pack and a fucking sleeping blanket. Oh, I did I did skip a thing that I wanted to show you guys actually. So let's backtrack a little bit. Let's pretend that climate change hasn't that section hasn't ended yet, right? <laughs> Okay. Because there's something we can do about it. Our campaign has the only fully developed Green New Deal budget in the country of any candidate, of even the think tanks out there. And it's $27.5 trillion over 10 years. $2.7 trillion. To transform the economy to zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions 100% clean energy. It's been a signature program in the Green Party throughout the 2010s. The Democrats took it, diluted the content, the non-binding resolution for a Green New Deal got rid of the ban on fracking the new fossil fuel infrastructure, got rid of the phase out of nuclear power, got rid of the military spending cuts to help pay for the Green New Deal, and extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050. So it's clear we're not getting the Green New Deal from the Democrats, but the Democrats are, don't have a serious climate problem. So that's why I say Trump calls climate change a hoax, but Biden acts as if it's a hoax. You want the Green New Deal, you gotta vote green. Goddamn right. I freaking love Howie, dude. I mean, I wonder if it's gonna be Howie and Angela again in 24, or if it's gonna be Angela. I don't know. I guess we'll find out in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> though. Our camp. So, obviously, we are now in U.S. news, and, uh, so 19 bodies were reinterred in Tulsa, um, the day back to the, to the Tulsa race massacre, uh, and protesters are demanding a criminal investigation because there was a bullet found with a set of remains that showed trauma. The bodies of 
19 people exhumed from an Oklahoma cemetery during a search for victims of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre were reburied in a closed ceremony on Friday, despite objections from protesters outside the cemetery. Quote, this is totally disgusting and disrespectful that those are our family members and we're outside the gate instead of inside that gate where they are, uh, said Sully Butler Davis, who said she was a descendant of a massacre victim. Um, we talked a little bit about Tulsa uh, during Black History Month and around the, the date of the 100th anniversary. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, but just a little recap, as, uh, as many as 300 people were killed in Tulsa in this uh, massacre when a white mob attacked Black Wall Street because how dare these black folk have any financial success. Right, jealousy and hatred turned into mass fucking murder. Yeah. Um, but there's an anthropologist that's investigating it. Um, that's, that's good. Her name is uh, Phoebe Stubblefield said a bullet was found with a set of remains that had trauma to the body, including the head. Um, and and uh, state representative Regina Goodwin uh, told the media, the, re the found remains, a skull with a bullet hole. That seems like you're kind of beginning to get somewhere in investigating the deaths. Um, and Stubblefield told the crowd, we are not done. We have not stopped. Um, some protesters wanted the reburial postponed, but a city spokeswoman told the Tulsa World uh, an intermittent plan was required in order to receive an interment plan, not intermittent. <laughs> an interment plan was required in order to receive approval approval to exhume the remains. Um, all on-site forensic analysis documentation. DNA sampling from the remains are complete, but the DNA matching with potential descendants could take years. Wow. Sounds like they need to step on the gas a little bit. Um, right. But I mean, I hope that the research that uh, that Miss Stubblefield is doing um, is, is going to help the city of Tulsa like, heal that wound, you know? Right. It's it's a matter of putting the truth out there because for so long, this is something that either got whitewashed or completely ignored. Like this is not something I ever heard about in school, mm -mm. but I should have. Fucking should have. I found about I found out about this as an adult, and was Same. like, "Whoa, wait a fucking minute, really?" Like, right. That happened here. You know, and I mean, and in the grand scheme of history, a hundred years ago is not that long. It's really not, but it's it's one of those things that when you're not even exposed to the truth about our own history until you're an adult, that's kind of a shocking thing. That's one of the things that actually got me looking into more events like this of like, what is our real fucking history? Because this shit got redacted at school. It's eye-opening when you've been fed bullshit about, oh, America the Great, your whole fucking life. And, and, and remember then, yeah. that when people are, like, afraid of critical race theory, that's mm -hmm. the kind of things that they're, that they're trying to stop. Right. They don't want you to know the truth about things like Black Wall Street. They don't, they want to keep those skeletons in the closet, quite fucking literally. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they should get to so our next story kind of bridges US and uh, international news the event itself took place in Seattle but they're marching in solidarity with the Colombian protests um, which I mean we've kind of had our eyes on Colombia for a while um, there's been stuff going on there for well, shit, 
a while. <laughs> a while. Months. Last year, right. uh, there was shit going on in Columbia when we were doing the research before we ever started the podcast. Right. <laughs> Um, the Columbian activists in Seattle are working tirelessly to spread awareness about mass protests in their home country. Uh, countrywide protests in the South American country were sparked in late April thanks to a tax reform bill proposed by right-wing President Ivan Duque. I might not be saying that right. Um, which would have placed extreme taxes on essential items such as milk, eggs, gasoline, etc. Uh, the legislation would have hit working class and middle class families the hardest, who were already struggling before COVID-19 hit the country. You know, um, it's one of the most economically unequal countries in the world. A 2018 report from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said that it would take 11 generations for a poor Colombian to approach the average income in Colombia. The longest time period out of all 30 countries in the report. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated this divide, shrinking Colombia's economy by almost 7% and increasing the poverty rate to more than 42%. Wow. More than 42% of their population is now in poverty. This is fucked. Um, Evelyn Carvajal, a Colombian social worker based in Medellin, told the Emerald, I shouldn't be forced to leave my country just for a chance at a better future. Colombia's protests have been met with some extreme police brutality, from rubber bullets to tear gas to rape, other sexual assaults, and murder of social leaders at the hands of the police. The we're we're going to be talking about the uh, Colombian situation in further detail in a minute, because there was a report published, I believe over the weekend, uh, basically pointing that these allegations at least have truth to them. Uh, even right. if they're, e even if the numbers documented aren't a hundred percent accurate, this is happening. Right, and that's something that again, a lot of people don't want to acknowledge. But it's like this is one of the reasons why we call them fucking pigs, because they go around doing this shit. What the fuck? This is a really fucked situation when more than 3,700 cases of police violence between April 28th and May 31st of 2021 have wow. taken place. Over 75 deaths. So what the fuck? What the actual fuck? <laughs> you know? And, and I'd like to point out, I, I mean, I know I'm going to be skipping a little bit here, but I'd like to point out in 2021, the United States government gave over $322 million in foreign aid to the Colombian government for, quote, peace and security, providing weaponry and funding for a corrupt national police force. What they should have been doing is going, if we're going to give you money, it's for, quote, unquote, peace and security, especially, it's going to be to uh, either purchase or build more housing for the people who are you know homeless to make sure that they and those in poverty are lifted up to a living fucking standard that you have food your fucking utilities are on you know things like that um not to buy more guns to try to fucking scare the shit well or not kill. even just buying guns they provided guns right like that's that's the worst thing that you could do in a situation like this. Be like, oh, here, oh, you've got people pissed because your economy is tanking and it's completely fucking unbalanced here. There's too many people living in poverty. You want guns? You don't need guns. You need food and shelter. And, and look at the stark contrast between Colombia and Cuba. Right. I mean, you know, the Colombians are protesting basically uh, you know, uh, the leftist ideals. So they provide guns to the government to maintain order, to maintain, quote, peace and security. That's not peace and security. But I mean, like, look at Cuba. I love my guns, but I can't eat them. 
Right, but I, I mean, like, look, look at the, look at how the U.S. government responds to Cuba. People protest in right. Cuba for one fucking day, and the U.S. is trying to fucking, you know, convince the world that airstrikes are a good idea. Right. Like, no, lifting the embargo so they can buy some fucking food to make up for the loss from their crops taking a hit this year. That's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Send them some millions worth of food. Anyway, yeah, um, you, you can go back to what you were saying, though. I just wanted to point out that little tidbit because it's it's a clickable link and everything. They have it cited. Well, um, on July 4th, Duque announced that he would ask the Congress of Colombia to pass police reform laws, including the creation of a human rights watch group within the department and the introduction of body cameras for all officers. Um, similar to the police brutality oversight in Seattle, local activists don't trust the pigs, you know, to effectively hold themselves accountable for violence against their citizens. Why should we? Um, you know, here's a, a quote from Daniela Cortez Barbosa. She's a leader in Seattle's Colombian solidarity group, Colum Colombianos, and Seattle Tenemos Juegos. Uh, she told the Emerald in a recent interview, our people are tired. After so many years of corruption, violence, and inequality, these frustrations have been brewing for years. This, this is fucking ridiculous how long this has been going on. Uh, Cortez Barbosa is 24 years old. She's from Bogota, Colombia. She's been working as an au pair in Seattle for the past year. And she said she couldn't stay silent when she saw the extreme violence at protests in Colombia through social media videos. The movement in Colombia is led mostly by young activists that make up the Primera Linea or First Line at protests and take the brunt of police violence. Hundreds of young activists have gone missing since the protests started in May, with little hope left for their families as there's little to no efforts to find them. Uh, Cortez Barbosa said we're the only country that could find the head of a young person in a plastic bag and everyone stays quiet, nothing happens. More than 100 people have disappeared since the protests started. There have been 28 reported cases of sexual violence by the police. At least 82 people lost their eyesight in the protests due to police violence. Heads are being found in rivers and no one is doing anything. Violence is being normalized in Colombia uh, but it shouldn't be ignored. Tired of the lack of action and empathy for her home country, Cortez Barbosa reached out to local Colombian restaurants for support during events. The first protest she hosted was in late April at the Space Needle with three of her friends. She expected about 20 people to come, but over 70 people showed up. With the support and energy from Colombians and allies in Seattle, she continued to host monthly caravans and protests, marches across the city to raise awareness about the realities of what's happening in Colombia. They named their solidarity group Los Colombianos and Seattle Tenemos Huevos, a nod to the extreme taxes Duque threatened to place on basic items such as eggs, and a double entendre, which speaks to the courage that it takes to speak out against a corrupt government. I love that. I have a thing for double entendres. They're fucking great. That's beautiful. Um, Cortez Barbosa says that though the problems of Colombians are facing, that the Colombians are facing are many, um, from hospitals closing during climbing cases of COVID-19 to increased poverty, hunger, and violence, she sees a way to help Seattle. When we ask the young activists in Colombia what they need, they say they need many things, but above all, they need a voice. This is why we say SOS Colombia. And Rob, if you can screen share that, there's some really good photos from these marches. Um, one of the most impactful protests the group held was at Cal Anderson Park in early June. The group created an artistic demonstration with white shirts covered with red paint to represent the hundreds of activists in Colombia that have been wounded or killed by the police for protesting. Flyers with QR codes linked to videos of extreme police brutality occurring in Colombia. Uh, we rely on social media for the truth of what's happening, such as Facebook live videos or Instagram live videos during the protests, since there is little uh, media coverage about what's happening in Colombia, said Cortez Barbosa. 
Uh, many videos are being censored on social media due to violence, but of course they'll be violent. Our government is killing us. The Solidarity Group hopes to have their votes counted in the May 2022 Colombian presidential election by traveling to the Colombian embassy in San Francisco to vote. We stand in solidarity and have marched alongside the Black Lives Matter movement, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Woman movement, and the Free Palestine movement here in Seattle. We stand in solidarity with everyone who is fighting a corrupt government, said Sebastian Diaz, a Colombian activist and youth worker who participated in the protests in Seattle. Cortez Barbosa knows that the current administration is part of a long history of corruption in Colombia, but she doesn't see giving up anytime soon. This isn't the type of paramilitaries or narcos we used to like Pablo Escobar, but we're still in the same hands as we've always been. It's the same politicians that move money illegally, however they want. The corruption continues, so we will continue to fight it, she said. If you would like to support the efforts of Los Colombianos in Seattle, Tenemos Huevos, you can find them on social media or uh, donate to Temblores, the police accountability organization on the ground in Colombia. And we will share those links in either the caption for this video or for the comments. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, so Al Jazeera um, reported on a report. That sounded stupid. An Amnesty International report is um, alleging that illegal detention and torture is happening in the Columbia protests. Uh, the sub headline is the quote. These events are extremely serious and must be invest investigated diligently, independently, and impartially. Um, so, that's that. Those aren't the only crimes, though. Colombian authorities have unlawfully detained, tortured, and used lethal weapons against, or you know, killed or attempted to kill, peaceful protesters during the demonstrations that have swept the country since April. Um, through an exhaustive digital verification of images and videos, Amnesty also confirmed that national police officials permitted active violence and urban paramilitarism by armed civilians against demonstrators and human rights activists. Um, the protests, which re reached their peak in May, have since calmed, although they saw a resurgence on July 20th, which is Colombian Independence Day. Since the start of the demonstrations, the National Police and Mobile Anti-Riot Squad uh, have been criticized for excessive force and repression of peaceful protests. Um, the largest protest took place in Cali, which has the largest Afro-descendant population in Colombia and the second largest in Latin America, where racism, classism, as well as the country's internal armed conflict have taken a toll. That would take a toll on anybody. Um, right. So in, in this country, Colombia has been dealing with paramilitary violence for decades. Right. We want to see a police state. There it is. Well, I mean, I don't even think you have to look that far. True. <laughs> but I mean, when it's at its worst of you know, this is just normal response for a militarized police force to attack protesters. You know, it's something we've seen more and more frequently here in the last few years, but this has been going on there for fucking decades. Yeah. It's solidified as a police state. Uh, like, this is just normal. And no, that shouldn't have to be anybody's normal. I to agree. not even be able to use your voice without being assaulted or killed, fucking raped, beaten. Right. Fuck the uh, police. Three protesters described in detail how police beat them, pressured them to confess to crimes they hadn't committed, and threatened to, quote, disappear them. And those practices are not isolated incidents, but rather reflective of a pattern of violent repression by Columbia, Colombian authorities, including President Ivan Duque, who fueled the protest by sending military units 
shaped by more than six decades of armed conflict in the city streets, the report concluded. Um, if you want more, there, there's a lot of calls for police accountability. Ultimately, that's what this, this I, I'd say at this point, you can call it a movement. I probably wouldn't have in April, but this is four months later. Um, and, and I mean, they have masses in the streets calling for police accountability. Um, so I, I mean, I guess what I'm encouraging is go look it up yourself. Uh, this particular story came from Al Jazeera, but they're not the only ones that have reported on it. Um, right. You're probably not going to find much in American media, admittedly. Uh, maybe NPR if you're lucky. But, you know, check out European media. I guarantee you're going to see stories about this. And this isn't a new situation. It's just a worsening situation. Um, I guess on to India. A, a monsoon session of parliament began this week. Um, about 200 protesters gathered in central New Delhi to continue their protests. So uh, keep in mind the farmers' protests have, have largely uh, subsided, but um, I, I think that the situation is still tense. Obviously, the farmers have not gotten their way. Uh, they were shut out of Delhi for months, and it, it sounds to me like some of them are starting to get back in. Um, so, I mean, don't be disheartened by that number. 200 protesters was just in central New Delhi. It, right. might, not, it might not be the same as driving the fucking tractors through the gates, but, you know. All right. Well, tens of thousands of the farmers have been camped out on the main high highways leading into New Delhi for more than seven months. So they still have a very strong presence mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, if 200 protesters gathered in central New Delhi to continue their protests, they have the support of millions of people a few miles away. They just can't get to them. Right. Um, but yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. They've been there for seven fucking okay. months. Um, but since they've been shut out of New Delhi, there's been a lot less violence and therefore a lot less reporting on it. Right. Like, they're uniting, though. They're having farmers' parliaments. Mm. If you're curious about that, check out hashtag farmers' parliament see what's up because they literally should have a say in the legislation that is affecting their fucking work their capacity to earn a living and that's where all of this started at and, and what concerns me about this farmers parliament is what they're doing is they're creating a worker state which we already know that this movement is very heavily sympathetic to the communist cause so I mean we could mm -hmm. see a replacement of the state being built right now right which would be fucking great it's about time that their working class there have control over its own means and not be at the behest of fucking oligarchy bullshit and and i'm not necessarily saying that we should look for that kind of uh extreme revolutionary front in this organization i think that they're probably going to be kind of more focused and dialed back um, so as to grow their movement. Um, because obviously not the entire Indian population supports it, but all the poor ones do. <laughs> so, right. I mean, they already have a, a great amount of class solidarity there, and they're just trying to expand on that. So, I mean, I'm really interested to see where that goes. I have high hopes for it, though. Uh, but just to remind everybody, um, in, back in late January, I mean, this article recaps it as thousands, but I recall it being tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but I'll take thousands. <laughs> thousands of angry farmers clashed with police after driving their tractors into security, uh, into security bar barriers 
Uh, one protester was killed and more than 80 police officers were injured. Farmers say uh, the, the laws favor large private retails, uh, retailers, rather. Um, surprise. Right. Not really. Prior to the new laws, um, those large private retailers were not permitted to procure farm goods outside of government regulated wholesale grain markets. Um, and the laws introduced in last September will unshackle farmers from having to sell their produce only at regulated wholesale markets. Um, it argues farmers will gain if large traders, retailers, and food processors can buy directly from producers. I mean, what it could lead to is a fucking price collapse. Right. That's part of why they started protesting in the first place, because they were already experiencing a price collapse for their own goods. And they're working their asses off. They, they can't afford to take that price cut, you know, um, when that literally means less food on their own table for their families. Right, right. It's gutting their entire farming um, business, I guess you should say. Um, it's, it's pulling the rug right from, out from underneath of them when it comes to having any negotiating at the table there for the prices they need to command for their produce. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I wanted to move back to Myanmar. I wanted to point out the military junta is still in charge. Um, this is an article from last month, actually, but I thought it was cool and uh, it was new to me. So I guess I'm hoping it'll be new to you too. Uh, but Myanmar protesters um, commemorated the 1962 student resistance, uh, July 7th. Um, and th these are the same people that have been protesting the military junta since, uh, was it February? Thanks. So. But they were commemorating a protest at Rangoon University uh, named after the city, which is now called Yangon, uh, and it implicitly criticized the March 2nd, 1962 coup in which General Ni Win ended parliamentary democracy and instituted military rule that would last five decades. And remember that that is what they are still, the, this recent coup is totally reminiscent of that. Uh, last time it took them you know, more than five decades to finally have a democratically elected government. And now the, is it president or prime minister? Um, Suchi. I think president, but I'm not sure. Same. Um, but young people have played leading roles in resisting this year's seizure of power and hundreds hundreds have been killed by security forces i mean it was hundreds months ago so right i don't think anybody actually knows um and, and they've been using a lot of like flash mob style demonstrations um you know since government troops started using lethal force uh they haven't been able to have uh huge protests where everybody shows out all day um, so they've been just, you know, flash mobbing. Um, right. On the other hand of that, other more militant groups have taken up violence against the government. And I can't even say that I fucking blame them. No. Nope. That wouldn't be Neither. an easy decision for anyone. But given the circumstances that they are under, I don't really see another option thing is, is i mean the the populace still definitely outnumbers the military that has you know done this coup 
But are they as well armed to be able to actually no. take out this military coup? That's the fucking problem. And they're like, how fucking dare you try to overthrow the government we elected? You know? <laughs> um, again, uh, a police state starting to form. Like, nah, they're, they're old enough to remember this still having been the case, you know, before even just a couple decades ago when they finally got their, you know, elected government in place and ended the last coup um it hasn't been that long no it was like 2011 i think something like that maybe it's more recent than that but i mean i know that it took them less than a decade right and and i know i think it was 2011 and i know it took them a couple years to set up the elections they didn't have an election system anymore Um, is, but in Yangon, is, which is the country's biggest city, protesters showed up flashing the three finger resistance salute um, as they chanted declarations of unity and denunciations of the military. Several set off smoke bombs and colorful hues, lending a festive touch to the activity, conducted at a trot to avoid the authorities. Gotta love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so there's a, also a fortune.com. Never thought that I'd be reading them on this uh, on this show. But um, even Fortune Magazine, I guess is a good way to put it, uh, is saying poverty in Myanmar will double by 2022. That's only four months away, following the military coup and COVID-19. Um, Myanmar's economy is expected to shrink 18% in the fiscal year ending September 30th. Uh, so they're talking in the next month. Well, yeah. two, two months. Well, two months. But holy shit, you know, that's almost double the World Bank's March prediction of a 10% contraction and reflects the worsening conditions in the country that's languishing under the compounding crises of a fucking military coup and a surge in COVID-19. Yeah, it's ah, beyond fucking ridiculous. Yet again, another situation where, you know, they're being fucked from multiple angles. Um, the World Bank said in its report, this economic deterioration will be hugely damaging to livelihoods, which for many years were already under severe strain. Um, estimating that 5% of the working population will lose their jobs and that the number of people living in poverty will double from 2019 to 2022. Okay, that makes sense. Not double in the next month, but double over that time yeah. period. Yeah. Which even that is still fucking extreme, you know? And the fact that the World Bank is even fucking acknowledging this, going, wait a minute, there's a fucking problem here, you know? Yeah, um, that's crazy in itself, isn't it? Right? You'd think that they wouldn't be so fucking concerned about the number of people living in poverty. Um, who knows? They may not actually be. I'd like to see them actually do something about it besides here's the results of our report um but the economic downturn threatens to unwind much of the progress that myanmar has made since democratic reforms began in 2010. um so yeah you're right there that that began then so yeah a decade a fucking decade that they've actually had well less because it took them time to set up the election system before they ever had an election right. mm-hmm it's just fucking sad that, you know, this is the state of things. You would think that this fucking uh, military coup would realize, oh, hey, we fucked up. We're fucking up. If we're completely crashing our economy, we're fucking up. Maybe we shouldn't be in power, dumbasses. Um, <laughs> but fuck, fuck forbid their egos fucking get a check like that like maybe you're not doing shit right. right um economic upheaval began when the military seized power on february 1st and deposed the elected government um the military arrested 
their president, um, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, during the takeover, they charged her with illegally importing walkie-talkies. What the fuck is that? Yeah, dude, she's been in prison for months for illegally for importing, importing walkie-talkies. Walkie-talkies. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a purchase that would be normal for anybody who is a leader in government who needs to like keep in contact maybe with the security team you know shit like that for your security detail is normal purchases how the fuck is that illegal importing and who fucking says the military gets to have a say about it right how is that the military's fucking job to worry about what's being imported um the but, junta's uh... power what Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, the Junta's power grab sparked uh, widespread protests from the citizens, many of whom engaged in civil disobedience movements, in, including uh, strikes, boycotts, roadblocks. Um, and the Junta responded with force, obviously. Uh, they've killed more than 900 protesters as of July, according to the Association for the Assistance of Political Prisoners. As stability in Myanmar deteriorated, foreign business began to exit operations in the country. Japan's Kirin Beer Company quit a joint venture with the military-owned Myanmar Economic Holdings in February. Oil giant Chevron and Total, which operate a Burmese gas project, stopped paying dividends to the junta in May. And Norwegian telecoms operator Telenor sold its Burmese operations in July. So nobody wants any fucking connection with this they're going nope you you yeah. have fucked up we're cutting and, ties and i mean like that's kind of crazy too which i mean don't get me wrong this hunter is definitely definitely fascist um but I, i'm actually really surprised that all these capitalist nations and private companies are even like uh no dude you're fucked right right they're like we don't even want to make money with you anymore you're so toxic right <laughs> you know that's bad right. that's bad i, I mean that being Chevron. said they did they did business with the previous military dictatorship but anyway even that speaks volumes that they were willing to do business with the previous one but this one they're like no bro you went too far you right. know and i mean what? they've had more than 77,000 new COVID-19 cases in the last two weeks with a population of 54 million people. They're suffering an oxygen shortage. Um, and, and that's the recorded cases. Analysts expect the totals are actually far higher. Um, Holy fuck. A lot of people are too afraid or unable to enter hospitals. And uh, a lot of patients are being treated by relatives at home. But Reuters reports the military has banned oxygen manufacturers from selling tanks to individual buyers, ostensibly to prevent hoarding. I call bullshit. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think that the, the government is probably the one that is stockpiling and withholding. Right. Um, from the especially, I mean, China, I, I mean, like, I they're not fans of the junta either but they still sent and let me scroll back down what was the the number in front of that they sent 3000 tons of 3, liquid oxygen tons of liquid oxygen um it's it's crazy like they're building a 400 mile fence along their border with Myanmar because of the second wave of COVID infections last September. So they're, they're like, keep it over there, but here, we'll send you some oxygen so y'all motherfuckers can breathe. Right. And what has the government done with that? Where is that? How are they having an oxygen shortage when they're even getting supplemented from their neighbors? Yeah. Sure um, sounds to me like the government's hoarding, not the people. <laughs> exactly. So I guess the uh, the next thing, I guess we'll keep it in Southeast Asia. So I'm going to change the order a little bit because it makes more sense for the flow. 
India reported 40,134 new coronavirus cases today. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. Um, 422 deaths, 40,134 new cases. I, I mean, if Dean is right, then that's still got a long way to go to his... I mean, he was saying that in, in the third wave in India, we could be seeing 100,000 cases a day. Right. So that's just climbing. Yeah. Um, and that's already immense. Just yeah. holy shit. So um, the, the last of what I have to talk about here... I, I guess I should say me. What we have to talk about here is uh, COVID related. So I guess you could say that we're doing a COVID segment for the first time in a while. Um, but it's also kind of international news. <laughs> so true. Um, moving on to Cuba, a little closer to home. Um, Iran will become. <laughs> I know I said a little closer to home, and then I brought up Iran. Cuba uh, has produced two vaccines. We've we've kind of followed their their vaccine uh, quest uh, pretty closely, um, but they have two, and they're both over ninety percent effective, which puts them on par with our Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, except for they are claiming a ninety nine point seven percent efficacy against death, and Cuba is complaining one hundred percent efficacy against death. Um, and both vaccines. So, um, but one was like 92.4 and one was like 91.8% effective. And that's right about where, uh, as I was saying, our Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they I, sent their uh, vaccines to Iran to, you know, help on both sides because Iran had some outbreaks that were getting pretty bad and now Iran is going to be helping with production for one of those <laughs> yeah for Us. Soberana too which yes. Soberana means sovereign I, I dig that <laughs> yeah the other one that is uh, finished uh, clinical trials is Abdallah and I, I believe that the Soberana 2 is the one that's 91.8, which is funny because that started as a two-shot thing, right? Like our Pfizer and Moderna, but they already have the Soberana booster behind it. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, basically, as they were getting ready to roll it out, they were like, oh, hey, it's actually a three-dose now. which I would still be fine with. And to be fair, I would trust theirs a lot more even than the ones produced here. You know, like, can we can we get some of that, that Cuban vaccine over here, please? I mean, dude, they have a vaccine for fucking lung cancer. Right? Can we get some of that? Send the embargo. They're making advances in medicine that you know, all of us could be benefiting from too and benefit them as well. Let's do some business because dude, you know how many people would go straight out to get the vaccine for lung cancer? Oh yeah. I know so, I would. Been smoking for decades. I wanted to touch on the, the <laughs> sanctions because I mean, Cuba and Iran are both ranked in the world's 20th highest COVID-19 caseloads per capita which is crazy because cuba was like number one in their handling of the pandemic up until the delta variant right um but they're they're charging that u.s sanctions uh are hampering their pandemic response including vaccine development that being said they still have two ready to go out of five you know right a lot of it is the shortage on the um needles Yep. To be able Which, to, to give the vaccine. Yep. Uh, Mexico sent some, uh, sent, well, they sent a lot more than just syringes, but Mexico sent a couple of loaded, like fully loaded chips. 
the supplies, mm-hmm. the food, syringes. Um, and Mexico is one of the countries that is uh, interested. Where was that list of countries? I know I scrolled past it. Yeah. Well, I know I read it when we were getting, oh yeah, there it is. Mexico, Vietnam, Argentina, and Jamaica are among the countries that have expressed interest in producing or buying its COVID-19 vaccines. Cuba's biotech sector has a long history of vaccine development, uh, producing 80% of vaccines used in the Caribbean island nation and exporting some of them. Um, And I mean, they would export a lot more if they had the capacity to or, you know, were allowed to. Right. Um, Again, if we lift this fucking embargo. the, The sanctions theoretically exempt medical products, but often in practice, uh, put foreign pharmaceutical companies off of trading with them at all, and banks from processing transactions with them. And that is ultimately why, um, you know, it basically limits their trade with the entire rest of the world. Because these, uh, these banks just won't process the transactions from the fear of being shut off of trade from you know, the United States, or in essence, the Western world. And Washington last month <clears throat> issued guidance easing the way for delivery of products to combat the pandemic to some heavily sanctioned countries, including Iran, but not Cuba. Here's your sign. That being said, um, these totals are from the 27th of July. Uh from Cuba, we've been kind of following their their vaccination uh, venture journey. I don't know, <clears throat> but uh, they they are. I, I don't want to say they're picking up the pace because I, I mean I don't know that they they necessarily picked up the face uh, the pace. Uh, considerably yet because I mean they're still working on getting more syringes but um, there's over two and a half million people or over 22% of the population fully vaccinated now and again that's a shot two weeks a shot two weeks a shot two weeks Mm -hmm. they've given over nine million doses I mean they're they're gonna get there before we do. I guarantee it. Great. The only thing hindering them is that lack of access to syringes. That's something that we can't claim here. Shoot, here we've got you know mostly an issue with people refusing to take a vaccine, and it's one of those things where it's like, look, we have multiple options available. So if you're worried about the risk of taking this vaccine, then check out the others, you know, um, and I totally get that with certain, you know, pre-existing conditions. If you have cardiac issues and whatnot, don't take the Johnson and Johnson one that's been throwing more fucking blood clots than any of the others, you know, um, do your research, rather read other people's research from actual scientists and educate yourself on those things because there's, you know, multiple options on the table of what you can actually get without having to worry about certain risks. Um, Another thing too, is a lot of people are scared because they're like, oh my God, mRNA, new tech. And it's like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, fuck the train. The reason why this was so quickly developed is because labs here have already been working on mRNA vaccines for years. They were already working on them for other coronaviruses, okay? Because COVID-19 is not the only coronavirus. Your common cold is a coronavirus. They were already working on this. And basically all they had to do was plug and play. Here's the coding for the protein spikes specific to Mm COVID-19 into this platform that they already knew was effective um, and safe. You know, like they, they've been testing this, you know, for 
quite a while now. So there's not a reason to be scared of that. If that has actually gone through years of testing, just like it should, the only difference being they changed this protein marker. I you would know? like to say that the United States had a, a key milestone on July 31st. We finally surpassed 50% of the nation being fully vaccinated. Still nowhere close to herd immunity. Don't get me wrong. But no, we but finally made it to 50%. Uh, remember, we started our vaccination drive right before Christmas. Right. So it hasn't been very long. Well, I mean... I was just going to point out that in Cuba, they didn't start until the uh, second week of May. Right. Uh, I mean, we just, so. uh, after seven months and change, just finally hit 50%. They started five months later. And right. And they were already at about, a, what was it? 22.6%. Uh, uh, okay. So, like, that's why I was saying they're going to hit herd immunity way before we do. Right. Um, they have a much smaller population to work with, but the thing is, we have higher production capacity here, um, higher access to things like syringes that's so common. Like, we already produce fuck tons of that be of that because of other things that we use syringes for you know like we have mass production here so we can't use that as a reason why we're not fully vaccinated or at least at herd immunity levels yet we have access we're not being held short by a trade embargo so August 1st <clears throat> which you know was a Sunday. Um, we 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 reported twenty three thousand new cases. That being said, don't get hopeful because that number is down. The seven day average is seventy or seventy nine thousand seven hundred and sixty three new cases. Uh, the spike that we are seeing now is bigger than the initial surge and the first wave. Actually, I can just screen share this. Why don't I just do that? Go for it. So, like you see here, we have you know the initial the initial surge, right? And then we have the first wave in June 2020, peaking out at a seven-day average of about 66,000 cases a day. <clears throat> right. And then we have the second wave, which peaked which out. Which is fucking enormous. Right. It peaked out January 9th with 251,000 new cases and a seven day average of 254,000. Sorry, January 8th. 300,000 new cases. Um, and obviously, you know, we started rolling out the vaccine and it looked like, oh, see, the vaccine made it all go away. Oh, well, this is still cold season. Oh, well, see, 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 the vaccine's working. We can open everything back up. And then we get slapped with, oh, shit, you started going to concerts and shit again. <laughs> Which sucks, because as a musician, I, I love going to shows. I would love to be out playing shows. But that shit scares me. Not many things scare me, but I've had COVID twice and that shit's horrendous. And the fact that the Delta variant has 10,000 times the fucking viral load as- Dude, the Delta the variant is variant? as contagious according to the CDC. This is why they changed their mask guidance. It's as contagious as the chicken pox. Right. Not, not quite, but almost as contagious as the measles. It's insane. That's that's one of those things where it's like, wait a fucking minute here, <laughs> you know, but we shouldn't have opened everything back up yet. I would love to get back to, you know, being able to go to festivals and shit like that. But, dude, this is going to explode. I'm anticipating yeah. this fucking third wave to be even bigger than the second. I've, I've looked at Dean's data, you know, 
it's been a minute. Um, I wish I had the link right on hand to grab and pull up of what his projections were. This is not going to be pretty. He, he even predicted that something along the lines of this Delta variant was going to happen. Before it because, did. Before it did. Obviously, yeah. it's been around for a while now. But right. the good thing is, and, and I'm not speaking, I, I'm not trying to downplay it by any means, but the deaths hopefully should be a lot lower because A, a lot of people are vaccinated and B, right. um, it doesn't, the Delta variant doesn't seem to be necessarily as deadly to most groups. So be careful, care about the people around you. Okay, get your vaccine, just do it. There's no excuse at this point. I mean, I encourage you to do your own research and I'm not just saying you should do it because I tell you to, but seriously, read what actual scientists have to say about it. We can get through right. this. Um, That's the thing, like, even though uh, they haven't updated the vaccine to include the Delta variant specific coding um it's still going to protect you some against that too that if you do catch it it won't be as bad of a case right um, I, I mean it's like 99.7 percent effective against death from the delta yes variant. that being a key factor that said there was some research i was reading the other day about some of the long-term effects now from people who have had covid and it's showing that if the virus got to your brain tissue, it can be affecting your memory, um, causing what they're calling COVID fog, things like that. So we're still yet to see, you know, even the long-term effects fully of how bad this is going to get because they were comparing the, the consequences of this infection hitting your brain to Alzheimer's. Okay, this isn't something to fuck around with. It's it's really not. Think about that, that even if you survive, you could have extensive long-term brain damage. So, uh, this is ultimately what I was wanting to talk about with Florida. More than 21,000 COVID cases on Saturday. Um, oh, they, didn't, they didn't even see that number at the peak of the second wave. <clears throat> it's crazy. Well, no... um, in Michigan, just from <clears throat> last week to this week, we've seen a 75% increase in cases in one week. It's fucking sad, dude. Yes, it is. Anyway, that's that's really all I got. Um, I don't want anybody to get too down over all this stuff. Uh, in terms of oppression, we do have an option. We can all unite, rise up together. Indeed. The whole point of bringing all these things up is to also work towards solutions. There's things we can do to actually improve things. Mutual but it's going to take all of us uh, working together. Yes. You know, like mutual aid groups, uh, uh, Marxist-Leninist organizations such as the PSL or the Communist Party, uh, the Socialist Party, the Green Party, even shit. Everybody's sick of it. Everybody's had enough. Um, you know, so it's time to build. It's time to organize. We can show a better world as possible. Mutual aid groups are out there making a reality every day. Right. It's the thing. We are not meant to be isolated creatures. We are meant to live communally. We're meant to help each other, to lift each other up. You know, today I might need help. Tomorrow I might be able to help you with something. 
Right. I think that's really all I got. I I just wanted to point out, though, that there are things that we can do. Contact your legislators about Medicare for All. Contact your legislators about a Green New Deal. It doesn't matter. Contact your state legislatures. You can get your state to enact uh, a single-payer system. It's possible. We just have to come together and do it as a united front. Well, we do actually need that on a federal level too, because yes, for example, I agree. here in Michigan, I, we, I agree. But I'm also uh, saying that if people are organizing in your state and you can get it, it built, yes, do it. Absolutely. But yes, However, we do I need it federally point out because that, we know that Kentucky isn't going to do it. Well, not only that, um, even in the states that do it, like, you know, here in Michigan, if you're out of state somewhere else, your Michigan Medicare is not going to cover you. So we we do need that to be federal across the board. Um, but before I forget, I meant to mention this to you earlier, um, on the memorandum for the um, evictions, we need to write an open letter to Congress and kick that out for everybody to be able to sign and send to their representatives, just like you did with um, the other one a few weeks ago and kick that out because if we have something clear and concise put together of like no you don't have the right to go and take a fucking vacation without extending this moratorium and making sure that people aren't losing their fucking housing while you're off fucking off at your third we vacation should house. we should also post around in some groups and try to get some other groups to sign on to the statement before we publish it yeah you know, come at it from Absolutely. the United Front from the beginning. We need to be reaching out to unions. Uh, we need yep. to be reaching out to um, activists. Um, but yes, I, I totally agree. And by the end of the week, we need to have that done. Yeah. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday, so we'll see. Sweet. Perfect. Um, All right. Anyway, though. I think it's probably about time we wrap this up. I gotta be to work in nine hours. I guess that's not terrible. Well, I guess go get some rest. You're gonna need it. <laughs> and right. uh, sleep well. I'll cross my fingers and hope my insomnia doesn't kick my ass tonight. Um, if you wanna work on some labor history stuff when you get out of work tomorrow, let me know. Will do. Sweet. All right. Thank you for Solid joining hearing. us. Yes, thank you. Uh, remember we to keep you. up with forwearemany.org. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Trisha. It's all good. <laughs> they probably caught both of us anyways, because that kind of... <laughs> it, it did kind of <laughs> flow. We love you. <laughs> we love you, and we appreciate you. That's all. <laughs> um, as I said at the beginning, you can contact us. You can message the Facebook page. Uh, you can send us an email for we are many podcasts at gmail.com. Um, make sure to keep up with our website for we are many.org. Um, see, tomorrow we have the final piece of the Communist Manifesto. Wednesday we have Emma Goldman's biographical piece. Thursday we have part 12 of Seize the Time. Thanks. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, quite a few podcast sites. We'll be here. Amen. Um, yeah. Oh, on that note, happy Monday. Have a good night.